Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 509th New Social Environment. I'm Anya, the events assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Rochelle Feinstein and Amanda Glubitzi. We're thrilled to welcome poet Bunny Wood here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on the Napahoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a document of resources that I will post shortly. And over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication, art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. Your contribution will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations here at the Rail. And so you can check the chat for more inf information and links to, to donate as well. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Rochelle Feinstein is a longstanding and dip, deeply respected member of the New York art community. Over the last past four decades, she has deflated the dogmas of modernism with humor and verve, liberally borrowing from different schools of painting as well as other mediums. Feinstein is Professor Emerita of Painting and Printmaking at Yale University. Among her numerous accolades, she is the recent recipient of the prestigious Rome Prize Jules Guerin Fellowship in Visual Arts, American Academy in Rome. And formerly associate professor at Ohio State University, Amanda Glubizzi is the founding co-director of the New Foundation for Art History and art scene editor for the Brooklyn Rail. She specializes in mid and late 20th century art, design and urbanism in the United States, Europe and Latin America. Amanda is the author of Art and Design in 1960s New York. So without further ado, please take it away. Great, thank you, Anya. And thank you to everyone at the Brooklyn Rail and to all of our participants today. We have a really, really lovely crowd, which is so nice to see and does not surprise me at all, given how much interest um, Rochelle's different exhibitions right now are generating on social media. Um, I just wanna say at the beginning that she currently has six solo shows going at the same time, six different venues, five different cities all over <clears throat> the world, um, across the United States and in Europe. And um, as far as I could tell, all at women owned galleries. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong about that, but that is also truly, truly exciting. So we're going to talk about these exhibitions and perhaps also talk about Rochelle's earlier work um, as that may come up. So as um, the muse strikes, put your questions in the chat. And so Rochelle, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you here. So as I mentioned, um, you have six different exhibitions going at the same time which is just kind of an amazing feat. So I wanted just to ask you first and foremost, um, how, did this, how did this happen? How are you still standing? Um, you know, tell us, just walk us through these exhibitions and while Anya runs through the exhibitions so that everybody can see what they look like online. Uh, that, that's great, thank you. I, I should have like a, a canned response for that because it's a question that comes up a lot. And every time I respond, this is, I think about it differently because it's so dimensional. I think that's why uh, it, it feels each time it's a different set of uh, ideas that come up. But it, it basically, I think, started um, with uh, the gallerist. It didn't start with me. I didn't presume to have that idea. And so it started in New York, uh, I think, with, with, with Bridget and Candace, Candace Mady at first. Uh, and then they um, started talking to uh, other of uh, their colleagues and talking to me, of course. And uh, you know, I got a very lengthy email uh, which was concise and, and saying, why don't we do this? Rather, and it was at a time when um, the idea was hatched at, at, at a time when everything was online, virtual and viewing room and uh, in-person viewing was not really not an option at all. It was, uh, you know, in, during lockdown, post-lockdown, pre-vaccine, uh, pre-Delta variant and so on. So uh, it, we proceeded from there and, and then it, it became, it is a collaboration 
between all of us. So I had worked with four of the six galleries before, four of the six, maybe five of the six. Uh, yeah, four, of the, five of the, five of the six. Uh, and so um, how do you go about doing this? Uh, some of the galleries had already had works uh, in their inventory with them uh, and, uh, and others did not. So we just kind of said, why not, you know, dealer's choice, uh, everyone should choose. Uh, what pieces were you, were you interested in? Uh, and I just put together a, you know, a, a kind of a, a batch of images uh, and what was available and I let them choose. So it was really not my choice at all, which I like, I enjoyed that. So it created a really interesting problem for me. Uh, and how do, I, how do I go about making this, uh, these actual contemporary shows, shows, shows that are right now and not uh, retrospective in, in, in any way. So how do I engage with my earlier work? I can get into that a little later. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, I think I, is that enough? Did I describe the way this- Yeah, I, I think so. Um, you had mentioned to me that um, you at least went down to Miami, if I'm if I'm right about this, or did you go to LA? I can't remember which one to help with the install. I went to Miami. Miami, okay. And I went to LA. Oh wow, okay. You're so lucky. <laughs> um, it's great to be there. I love that. So even though it was dealer's choice. Um, what to include, you were very much involved in how to include it. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Uh, how to. Um, I, did, I didn't think, I didn't edit any of their selections. Uh, and each one chose quite, uh, quite, from, quite differently from, you know, groups of, groups of pieces. And, and they were not consistently about a certain period of work because my work doesn't really lend itself to that kind of uh, categorization. Uh, so, but it just, it kind of, what you're looking at now is Bridget Donahue's show. And that one really, she selected, I think the first, first four or five images in that a, a batch of available images I sent and boom, right off the bat, the show had an, I, I, there's an idea for a show and, and, and those works had a, an, a, you know, they were different chronologically, uh, but it, they, they seemed to all be grid based. It was a time in my career earlier where everything was specifically, uh, uh, dealing with the grid so that became easy and on and on so and and nina nina johnson said how about color and i said well i don't really work that way i mean and so and then i thought wait a minute but i kind of have she, she made some choices and i said oh i can do this uh so it became a way of engaging with my past and the present so it really was an inversion the past kind of looped into the present and in, 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 for me in an interesting way and if, frustrating at times of course uh, how do I how do I do this? Um, but I'm kind of happy with the results. So well, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. That's good. <laughs> um, it, it is interesting because even in the New York shows, we can see a range of about 30 years yeah. between some of the earlier works and some of the later works. And one of the pieces that Anya has gone by already, <clears throat> push. Um, the dates are from 1996 to 2022, so a, a huge span of, of yeah. your, your career. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that, um, how are they talking to each other? How, how do these works like address each other um, across the room, across your career, across time? Um, well, I, I, since I kind of felt like when I entered into what I hoped was would be my mature or my grown up, you know, professional like work, uh, and I really felt confident. It worked that I felt confident about, mm -hmm. and and that really dates from about eighty nine. I kind of pulled out of something I needed to get out of for a couple of years, and I figured something out. So, um, so addressing that, one of the one of the thoughts when I kind of felt that I knew what I was where I would where I would go I had a lot of rules and I've talked about this before uh, but um, one of them was to uh, make work that would not be recognized as a fixed period done in a fixed period or my early work or transitional work I really was not interested in those categories for myself I, I was really interested in something else a, a number of things so that that when you mentioned that piece push um, that's a pretty big span. And uh, how do I address that today? And it really, for me, became these, that piece is very tactile. And I don't think the image kind of really indicates uh, that kind of materiality that's, that's in the piece, but it, start, it started from an Annie 
Albers drawing for a textile. And so it really started from something which wasn't like um, considered to be painting. So I wanted to make a painting starting from somebody else's uh, uh, kind of drawing. And then how is that translated into an abstract form? Uh, and so it kind of the first two pieces of the diptych, uh, one, the other one was made out of my, my clothes, um, which were you know, cut up and, and pasted together. Uh, and the third one really was very simple for me in a sense, because I, this, I hate to say, oh, I'm making pandemic art because I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm not addressing the work in that way, but one of the things that's been really absent uh, in the past two and a half years, almost two and a half years now, has been the sense of real materiality of the sensorial, of touch, of not being touched. Uh, and so uh, that, that third piece was really pretty uh, apparent to me when I saw this fake, fake fur stuff that I really had to kind of like put a stop on it. You know, you can't touch it. So, and it was consistent with the black and white language of everything else, so. Mm -hmm. Um, if, if you uh, follow me on Instagram, you might notice that actually I've taken a detail of that right hand panel and that's oh. in my post about this, this particular NSE that we're having right now. Um, and so what you can see from that, that detail on Instagram is that this is in fact faux fur and then there's um, a piece of what is it like acrylic or something like that right over top of it it's that's kind of smooshing it. Oh yes, uh, yeah, it, it is. Um, where'd my Zoom go? Sorry, I lost you. We have not lost you. We can see. We can see oh. you still. I think I have to flip out of my screen here. Okay. Something happened. Sorry. How do I do this? I'm really. Yeah. Can you hit escape? Maybe. Thank you. Tried that. Not there. Um, what about uh, if you like scroll down with your your cursor down to the bottom and maybe look to see if you can see your yeah. um, your taskbar? If I can if, interrupt, sorry. Thank you. Got it. Okay. Okay. Awesome. okay so <laughs> I, I was listening while I was hunting around. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, that was very. Thank goodness that you know one of the few stores that still exist on Canal Street is Canal Plastics, and and I, I a number of other I tested a number of elements to really add to that. And I wanted to sort of make a drawing by just making pressure. So um, it was, it's just very simply screwed in. And so the edges come out, that was also very deliberate um, to give a sense of what you couldn't access by teasing a little bit. Um, you say you wanted to make a drawing through pressure. Yeah. Um, this is such an interesting way of thinking about drawing, right? Of course, because drawing is made through pressure, right? The pressure usually of a pencil on paper. Correct. Um, yeah, if we if we were to think about um, other forms of art making, though, that use pressure, we might also think about printmaking. And I'm curious, just off just off the top of my head, could you consider that right hand panel a form of printmaking? Uh, well, I, I don't because it there's no kind of transposition that takes place. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it, and, and so I, th I would say not, but I th I'm interested in what you say about that as a as a you know a possible way of, of drawing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I I was I was very struck with a pattern that I could not make by doing that by putting mm -hmm. that pressure mm -hmm. on that by, on that piece. And then um, so that really uh, it, it startled me when I did it, and I thought that's it. Yeah, it, it startled me when I saw it, <laughs> actually. I had seen, of course, the images from the galleries already. And then when I went to see it in life, I was, I was stunned <laughs> that it was so far. Oh, thank you. I'm glad. It was, I'm glad. One comment I wanted to make but between, yeah. between that final, that third panel we're talking about and the first panel, which mm -hmm. is initially based on the Annie Albers, and then it was uh, an Agnes Martin, which is on the upper right of the larger piece, mm -hmm. is that the Annie Albers was very much, in, it was very the work in a little capsule. I don't think I can <laughs> describe exactly uh, everything about it, but it, it was um, really based upon you know weaving, and that is a real a real material and uh, weaving of uh, what would potentially be cotton or wool, uh, depending, uh, not synthetics. And so this final piece also is kind of I think the state of where things are now. This kind of the idea of the, the synthetic, uh, the un, the inorganic, mm -hmm. and so I really kind of wanted to cap it with this inorganic. Um, material which uh, which you really uh, can't make contact with mm -hmm. rather than something earlier. So. 
I, I'm my whole brain is just like exploding with possibilities of, for that <laughs> panel. Actually, I'm thinking about um, automatic drawing um, as a way of actually releasing the hand as opposed to putting the hand on the yeah. paper. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, which is so uh, wow, fabulous to think about. <laughs> um, but also then this idea of the inorganic, and of course, um, you know, we would think about the move like from nature to culture or something like that, right? That, you know, all art making, of course, is kind of inorganic in an interesting way, but this then takes it and like turns that inorganic dial up to like 50,000 or something. That's very generous. <laughs> uh it, it yeah it it's it, it really it's speaking in a way that I want these conversations to happen between works one across from the other. I think for me it's it's speaking to the the what I was trying to do in the first instance in 1992 or three whenever whatever that 96 and 96. Yeah. Okay, um, we we had actually moved off of a an image um, that Anya was number 16 um, to go back to this image. And I find this really interesting too, because this is actually hung across the gallery from the triptych um, and is kind of actually a perfect repost to that triptych, right? Um, find your own damn voice. Um, mm -hmm. So wonderful to think about something, starting with Annie Albers, using some faux fur and these like really, really um, like, disturbing man-made materials mm -hmm. and then we turn across the gallery to see this brightly colored image that um, is covered in images of other people's work it's all my work oh it is all your work oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> tell me more no and i i think it's great that it looks like I, I thought it was other I've, I've long been uh, kind of categorized as someone like her work looks like that of 40 other people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love this idea of, um, I, I, I have to say my, my art historical chops betrayed me. Well, you totally led me astray. I did not. <laughs> it, was um, it was not intentional. <laughs> what, what we can't really see from this image, um, because we're looking at it from a distance, is that uh, these are hung using um, just like little Velcro strips or something, right? Yeah. And yeah. so the grid then can be altered. Yes. And, and uh, yeah, I, I have altered it. Yeah. You have altered it. Okay, I, that was going to be my next question. <laughs> and so in this in this instance, are you then telling yourself to find your own damn voice? Or are you telling us to manipulate the piece to find our own preferred way of looking at it? Yeah, I think that this idea of one's voice, whether uh, in painting or in 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 literature, you have to, one is supposed to find their voice, mm -hmm. and so that for me was a very the phrase itself is a potent one, uh, but it's also one which it was the piece was done in response to something earlier, mm -hmm. um, so I can get into that if that's yeah interesting please. yeah that would be great. <laughs> um, I guess in 93, and I hadn't shown my work for um, a, a few years. Um, it was like not really showable. I mean, not, I thought it was very showable, but, and so I, because I was getting a lot of confused sort of visits uh, in which uh, not, not well by artists, some artists, but mostly by, you know, potential gallerists who, who would come up. Uh, for a visit and they'd say, well, can't you do like five of those? And and just, I'm like, no, I, I can't. So finally, there was an opening, David Beitzel, um, may he rest in peace, was a wonderful guy and a, had a wonderful gallery. And I had shown him my work and he was just, you know, it was a nice visit. And then I got a call a few months later and, and he said that one of his artists had dropped out of their slot. And what I show in the small room, I said, well, I want to show them both rooms. I, I mean, I was like tired of waiting. <laughs> so, so I did this amazing show and it got recognized by wonderful people and, and I got to do what I wanted to do. But as a result, there was a painting in that show uh, in which had a dish, was a dish towel. And so I got a lot of responses, um, mostly by women artists who uh, were, were like, great, it's domestic, you're a feminist artist, you're making you know, work about domesticity. I'm like, ah, 
I'm not really comfortable with that, with the, you know, the, the idea of classifying my, my work, because it was also really early in my program, so to speak. So I, I did this piece because I got really annoyed. I said, well, you know, find your own damn voice. I was like, that was my response, but I wanted to really demonstrate how I found my voice, if I could be so presumptuous. So the bottom is, the work is really all about a grid. Mm -hmm. uh, so I laid out the grid, my grid development, basically, uh, and how I found my voice. So the bottom panel comes from a lithograph, where I was strictly thinking of the grid as a unit of measurement or a, a narrative in Quattrocento painting for example, how you move in three different spaces by the, uh, the scale of the, of, of the grid or the floor. So it starts at the bottom and ends up with unit pricing codes that are woven together, blah, that's it. <laughs> so it's, 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 a, it's a shout out to everyone. You can go, do it, find your voice, find your damn voice. It, got, it was pretty cheeky. Uh, <laughs> and um, given that you, you taught for such a long time, did you find yourself catching yourself if you would say that to a student? Like, you know, like, well, where's your voice in this work? Or, or did you never say that then? God, I'd shoot myself. <laughs> 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 no, <laughs> no, but I, I think that's a common, it, it used to be probably in my generation more commonly heard mm -hmm. uh, criticism. Um, you, you've mentioned the grid a couple of times, and this is something, of course, that comes up in every single thing that I've read about you now, and um, I, I've now read quite a bit about you. So I guess, what is it about the grid that's appealing? Is it that it ends decision making, or is it that it forces decision making? Interesting question. Um, I think the decision about the grid has already been made. And in terms of painting, at least when I came into it. And mm -hmm. so, uh, I mean, the kind of, uh, you know, raft of, of, of uh, historical writing, uh, critical theory, criti uh, criticism, uh, really about the, the grid. And it's a modernist uh, form or mm -hmm. trope, or it has meaning, it has multiple meanings. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I think it's something that I, I, I both need to uh, establish to kind of have it move out into the world. And, and because I see grids everywhere, I'm looking at a screen, which is a unit of measure basically. So, yeah, so it became both. So I kind of, it, it's, it's, it's I, I kind of kind of like get a jolt from it. You know, it pushes me to do something mm -hmm. uh, and because I work with language a lot too, or, you know, like words it really inspire me, uh, phrases. And so how do I apply a grid to something that's active rather than something that is, you know, more let's go passive. It needs to be charged by purely paint or something. So, mm -hmm. is that a, a okay answer? I, I think so. I, I like the title of this painting, by the way. Grids are us. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> like great to land on. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> um, it's it's interesting to me because, of course, you're totally right that the the grid is something that we we see as you say in Renaissance painting, um, it, it permits um, artists to use it so as to suggest perspective, for example. Mm -hmm. um, we can think about the grid in terms of the typographic grid. Um, so relating to your interest in text, although not necessarily text so much as text building, yeah. um, like you know, we're, we're both in New York, so we can think about the grid and, and this city, which is so dependent on a three-dimensional grid. Um, our grid, of course, goes laterally, but it also goes up and down. Um, but I think what's kind of interesting, too, and this isn't often talked about, even though people cite the Rosalind Krauss essay about grids all the time, is that in one very brief phrase, she actually suggests that it could be a trap, too. Um, that it permits you to be free because it can permit things like um, uh, a removal of the artist's decision making and things like that. And it can actually be infinitely expandable. Um, we can think about, for example, an Agnes Martin going as far as she ever wanted it to go. Um, but it can also be something that can trap an artist. And I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. As a person who's worked so much in grids, have you found that? Well, the, the trap part, I don't really, I comprehend too well. I mean that mm -hmm. that part, and um, I I I think you know you, you sent me a note, um, and 
what was the word you used? Uh, it was from Krauss, I think. It's, it's, a, it's a principle of physics. Uh, oh, yeah. She says that a grid can work centripetally or centrifugally. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm centrifugal. Okay. <laughs> uh, in that, in that it, it, it's, it's there, and then I, I react to it. Okay. Uh, something, something happens, uh, a mm -hmm. break. Uh, so, so I think the latter. I haven't read that essay in a very long time, but I yes. remember thinking about it a lot, mm -hmm. but, you know, quite a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's of course, one of the major, major works about grids actually in, yeah. in art history. Um, so somebody just texted centrifugal nation, which <laughs> is kind of hilarious <laughs> to me. Um, your grids, do they need to be squares or rectangles or can they be more organic they are either squares or rectangles and okay. they're not more organic except in the show candace matey mm -hmm. where that is something oh thank you <laughs> <laughs> perfect <laughs> yeah um that is quite is quite something else mm -hmm. so some of it is so are you are you referencing the 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 flower shapes here yeah okay um so one of the things that um, everybody should know about Rochelle's work is that her titles are so fabulous that as a writer, you look at the title of something and you're like, damn it, no, I can't use that word. Um, and so one of these paintings is called Gyre. Um, and, and so I assume this is, is the, the shape or the motion that you're thinking about here. So can you tell us a little bit? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it, Okay, this, this actually starts from the choices that that Candace made, mm -hmm. uh, which were uh, two two paintings. I think one was done in 2003, and the other one was done in 2008, maybe. I, I, but they were because I'd worked with her for a long time before she closed and then reopened the, the gallery. Thank goodness. Um, shout out to Candace for doing that. Uh, I had she chose these pieces that we'd never worked with before. And they both had flower forms, so I had to rethink that. So there we have my flowers, and I'm particularly um, the jar. I'm, I'm particularly interested also, and in, it's a kind of becoming a long time uh, preoccupation or occupation of mine, which is which is about Amazon, uh, not the Amazon, but Amazon and and its you know overarching presence in all of our lives, and now into space and everything. Mm -hmm. So. Um, with all their whatever they're doing and their so in any event um i really and so i was thinking about flowers when i made that wrong piece or you know or however you say it um really came from i had a residence at, at giverny uh in in 2003 i think mm -hmm. and so i was thinking a lot about gardens and and i never went back to it so here um, I really started thinking about that form, that radiant, radiating form, but the way it related to me to Amazon was really cardboard because in, in the pandemic, I mean, I was in New York the whole time and I mean, I was looking at everybody's beautiful like images on Instagram of flowers and these gorgeous lush paintings of flowers and flowers and I was like really stuck. And so I started thinking about really using these materials which are so present and ubiquitous uh, in order to kind of construct uh, my own garden, which to me really relates much more to the condition of climate change uh, mm -hmm. than it, it does to my actual gardening, which I, I don't really do. Um, so, so the gyre was really that form which goes, was it centripetal? <laughs> it, 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 fo it follows the curve. Mm -hmm. And so basically that's sort of what I was doing with, uh, with all those new works. Mm -hmm. Um, it's interesting to me too, of course, because flowers open and close centripetally and centrifugally as well, right? Um, they, they, of course, like reverse their motion. And so they actually do wind up being kind of very much akin to the way that Krauss is seeing the grid operate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, what was interesting to me too in these works is... Um, that you're you're looking at the pansy. Um, my my mom is particularly passionate about pansies. So whenever I see pansies in art, I'm, I think about my mom. Um, 
but she really likes them because they have faces. Me too. <laughs> oh, okay. So tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it, it, I, I have a whole lot of photographs, but when at Giverny, I realized uh, actually something about the synthetic nature of Monet's garden, which, I mean, it's been written about many times. So he had gardeners who shifted the garden and way to what he wanted to paint and, and so forth. But in terms of what it is now, how it exists now as a tourist site, um, the, the, these pansies are the first thing that I, I noticed when I got there in June of 2003. And, um, and periodically, um, every three weeks or so, the gardeners would rip everything out and put all new colors in, not just the pansies, but the plants and everything. So it would, everything would change the colors. So we started out one way and not the other. I started taking pictures of these pansies as groups, uh, uh, clusters of people or dominant personalities. And I mean, I started really ascribing qualities to them. So I went back to, and the, the one of the paintings has the initial pansy portrait, which I call paintings little as victims. Yes, and, I wanted to ask you about that. <laughs> They're trapped in a grid. <laughs> this is where it's both. It's both the, con the contrapetal and the contrafugal because I that that shape, which I basically, it, it's not a perfect square. It's at 38 by 40, mm -hmm. so it's, it's off by two inches. So it's not, it's an imperfect grid, right? So it's already, it's bumped. It, it has a bump in it. And, uh, and so I just really followed that and kind of really going around that grid, but following from the inside out rather than the outside in. Mm -hmm. um, I like the way that you talk about this, that it has a bump in it. Um, do you feel like that it, it, it slows us down when we're looking? It slows me down when I'm painting. Okay, okay. So it's kind of like a speed bump for you then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because mm -hmm. most of work I'm doing now is off by one or two inches, off square by one or two inches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want to turn it upside down you know, when I'm working on it, <laughs> unless it's, I deliberately do that, but I don't want to do that to find the painting. I, you know, I, yeah. I really, I, I like establishing where, where it is uh, mm -hmm. from, from, from the beginning, where at this point, um, it, it, that started to happen just by, by reiterating that rectangle, but from the inside out, mm -hmm. um, I, I knew I had a goal, <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The goal um, was something that was kind of squarish. That big yellow thing is almost yeah. a square. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very close to square. It's true. Although I, I think in life it feels less close to square. Yeah, which is kind of interesting. Um, uh, those of you who are in New York or or Miami or LA or Zurich or Paris, if you haven't gone to see Rochelle's shows yet, go and see them because they so much repay this this looking in person and close yeah. looking. Um, with the pansies too. I'm wondering if there was something um, in particular for you about the way that they open and close that was interesting and, and kind of informed your grids or, or if no. no. Not so much, mm -hmm. no. I mean, I haven't, I, I guess I'm, <laughs> I think of them as portraits more <laughs> and uh, more or uh, groups or group portrait, school mm -hmm. portrait, uh, rather yeah. than the closing where they suggest um, something else. I mean, because there are flowers, of course, that do close at night and others that open at night. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I wasn't really thinking about that. No. Um, one other thing that I wanted to ask you about in the, the Candace Mady show was the, um, the video that you included, the Murmurations video. Um, Perfect. Thank you, Anya. Thank you. <laughs> um, so this is, in fact, one of the, the initial things that we see as we enter the gallery. And it's certainly something that we hear throughout the gallery. Um, and so it's just this, this tiny little screen down at the bottom near the, the base molding of, of the room. Um, that shows these, these birds in murmurating form. And um, I was curious about this too, and this is actually what I was thinking about when I asked you about whether your grids were organic or not. Um, because I'm curious about whether or not you can understand the murmuration as something that's akin to your grid forms. Yeah. Um... I think that the, the piece was, I mean, this, this is a selection, uh, this particular unit of, of loop, which is very short, mm -hmm. uh, was made uh, largely because I, I wanted the sky to appear more 
present than than the actual birds, but I wanted the sound of the birds. It's been tweaked a lot, you know, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. all tricks basically. But um, I hadn't really, but I, when I was in Rome, uh, you know, it, the Academy, I had an extraordinary studio. It was, it was a great studio and I, I loved working in it. And a lot of good came, came out of being there for, for the year. Uh, but one of the, and I had a terrace on the outside of my studio that overlooked Rome. It was really spectacular. That and, sounds horrible. I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, 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 thank you. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I would just go out there and I'd hear the birds. See? So in Rome, and this, this is where I didn't think I'd be using this thing at all. I just did it for myself, the video. I'd just go out there periodically and on my phone, just you know, uh, record it because the, the sound was so like uh, overwhelming. And then the vision was, so there are these huge, and many people have probably seen these in different places. Uh, uh, these are starlings and, and they gather around, you know, just before sunset and they swarm all over. Now in Rome, it's a very particular problem. They're really not supposed to be there in those numbers, just as I did an earlier piece about, um, uh, Lonesome George, uh, the last of his species uh, who died. And, and so I'm very interested in how the environment has affected various species, including us. So the starlings, uh, what they do is they, there's such a problem in Rome that people walk around with umbrellas because of the, the guano that, that they're, they're all over the cars. Uh, they're just like everywhere and they don't, don't know what to do about getting rid of them. And I thought in the context of this show at Candace's using the flower form and really trying to be attentive to my concerns, uh, which I'm not saying that I, you know, I'm making it, I'm not acting as an environmentalist. I'm trying to kind of create somehow uh, uh, through, through the means that I have as a visual artist um, to, to represent something about the condition of life now through my painting. So that's, the murmuration seemed important to kind of contextualize that it's an alarming sound and it's ceaseless, mm -hmm. uh, it, it continues. And so that's why I wanted the piece in there. I think too, what's one of the interesting things about it is that um, the sound basically then it serves as a soundtrack for the rest of the exhibition. Exactly. Um, and so it's something that can't really be escaped. Um, you know, I think, I guess we could put in headphones or something like that. Yeah. Um, but I was kind of curious about that too, because in doing reading about your work and, and the way you prefer to exhibit your work, you, you mentioned something about how you feel like you want each piece to, to have its own presence its own space to speak for itself and so even if it's hanging next to another work it also needs to to tell its own story and so I was very very curious then about the soundtrack that kind of goes over and across the rest of of the pieces in the show uh yeah um I I think it's sort of giving I haven't really thought about this. this. Is just my intuitive response to your yeah. response to this question. Um, I think it was for me a way of. I knew it had to be there, but more or less a way of finding a location for those works. And and talking about in some way that the exterior world, not the world of the gallery or the individual painting, but mm -hmm. giving them a, a a place where they could be understood, or where I could understand it, mm -hmm. um, you know, as as a, a kind of a crisis or a, or or a directionless or a inconclusive, uh, all sorts of reasons for it to be there. It's not not singular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see. I, I was thinking too about the way that um, starlings group in the murmuration. And so they remain singular, but wind up actually then forming this greater body. Um, and, and was curious too about whether you were thinking about that in terms of your own work, that each piece is its own thing. And yet it forms this body that isn't necessarily a, a cohesive whole, but is is something that can be can be mutable or or can constantly be shifting for you. It's a, it's a very interesting thought. Um, I didn't think of it that way, you know exactly. Uh, but the, you know, I, I think that I, I 
it was very, I mean, I worked with Nick Reimer, who may or may not be around, who's a great video editor and who I work with. And he, he knows kind of me well enough to mm -hmm. put it together uh, in a way where, you know, it, it was very easy to do uh, in that, um, or it was, it was smooth. It was really a smooth journey. But I, I didn't want them filling, the way they do move, they can fill the whole sky or it would fill the screen. Mm -hmm. yes. But I wanted this to be that color sky and to be that much sky and that those many clouds. And I just wanted them to be, I didn't want them to be the subject. I wanted the whole thing to be the subject. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's very grid-like, actually. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I want to move um, Anya to slide 43, if you don't mind, um, just because here too is an example of a way that you might see two of your pieces next to each other um, and that are made at slightly, you know, different purposes, different times um, that may have a conversation with one another, but aren't necessarily um, speaking the, the same sentences. Mm. Yeah, they, these two were made as a diptych. So, um, okay. yeah. Uh, and that is from, I think, 2016 or 2017. So, fairly, mm -hmm. fairly recent. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I again, I mean, I, I, the, the name of the, they were in a show at, at Candace's, and uh, the name of the show is Who Cares? And, uh, and that, that kind of thought, and that was really, around uh, the time of the 2016 election where I was just like, what the fuck, you know, <laughs> how do you deal with this at all? So, um, so a lot of the, the work that I did was really based around um, that idea of who cares. And, and I think this piece in particular, they are meant to go together. And in fact, those two kind of uh, uh, circles in the middle of each work, they're exactly level with each other. And so I thought of this as a kind of a binocular piece rather than a Interesting. monocular Interesting. <laughs> piece. So that um, this is basically, a, they're, they're um, a tra transforming or manipulating or distorting uh, what we know as the color wheel, mm -hmm. which is, has a certain standard formation uh, and standard palette. Uh, if you're just you know, moving the palette around, of course it has primary, secondary, tertiary colors and all that. But I really want to do something else with the color wheel and to really disrupt it and, 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 and introduce a palette there, which is an introduce a palette of other colors, which into the red, yellow, blue configuration. And there's also kind of small, there's glass thrown in there, there's all sorts of things, abrasive things that are thrown in. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the, its pair there is something which is really uh, done, which is like this black hole. Uh, so, and, and it's like, it, it becomes like, what is its limit? And, and we don't know, you know, its scale, its limit, we know nothing. That's my, it's, it's, of course, the painting doesn't infer that, but that's my mm -hmm. thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And so this is really, a, again, it's a distortion of the entire color wheel and it's all done with enamel paint and a sponge brush. And it, it conforms more to the grid. So it's mm -hmm. taking, it's, it's squaring the circle. Nice. <laughs> um, I was really, really curious about these because, of course, these are in Miami, and so I can't see them in life. And so, how how deep of a black hole is that black hole? I mean, are we are we thinking about like a Lee Bontecu like gaping maw sort of thing, or um, are we like thinking about like a Reinhardt? How how black is? Yeah, that? yeah. I mean, th those are really interesting and good good references. Uh, but I, I think it's just, it is what it is. It, mm -hmm. it, it just, you, you, where do you go? I mean, it's just, you can't, you can't go in it. You, you kind of have to stay on it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's a kind of, um, it's also about, for me, um, well, if they're together, you have to see them together. How do you, how do you parse these two things that look very different to, mm -hmm. to exist in the same mm -hmm. language? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, visual language. And so they're relational. I mean, I, this is where form is very interesting for me yeah. uh, to you know, work with standard form and then see what I do with that. Um, do you always envision them being hung so closely together or can they be across the room from one another? No, they can't. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> Because I say so. Well, of course, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, th I think because they, their differences are important to mm -hmm. see in in uh, in 
in the same sort of uh, territory. Yeah, mm -hmm. same plane. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think I totally understand that. Um, uh, Anya, can we go to the next image, number 44? Um, this is the image that I saw first from the Nina Johnson show and um, felt intuitively that this had to be about the color wheel. Um, and I don't know why. Um, why do you think that is? I think it, it because it may be, uh, you probably know the answer yourself, but what I would say is um, because it, 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 there's an inferred center and then it's mm. blown apart. It just, uh, it, it, it explodes. Mm -hmm. So there are some wedges that are familiar, mm -hmm. these wedge shapes, but it was very specific yeah. to not have them all be wedge shaped. Mm -hmm. I was interested that when this um, red orange overlaps the like olive green, they become this like in more intense red, yeah. um, which is uh, counterintuitive um, and uh, provocative to me. And I was kind of curious, I, I'm, I'm almost afraid to ask you this question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um, is this a feminist painting? I'm a feminist, but I don't know. Is it? Uh, I, I don't. Oh, I you know, It's like asking, like you know, is this a political painting? You know, mm -hmm. I, I, it's very hard to kind of nail what something political may look like or what effect it may have. Mm -hmm. Is it feminist? I think for me, it's it's a painting really about being dissatisfied. Mm. Uh, or, or uh, it, it, this is insufficient. The tools are insufficient. And in fact, that the, for me, the uh, painting is is real question for me. Even mm -hmm. though I'm completely engaged with painting, uh, but this is a, it's a tricky one. You can't tell on the slide, and you haven't been in Miami, so you can't see it. This is actually made out of paper. It's not paint. Oh. So <laughs> it's a collage, <laughs> an assemblage. And I wanted to do something that looked like a painting. It's off color. The color is way off, but it's off. It's all off, off, uh, in my in my view. Uh, it 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 uh, it's uh, it's using a, a Kozumariki. It's a wonderful paper that is no longer made, unfortunately. I think I bought the last batches of it. If anybody out there has more for me, give me an insight to where I can get it. Let me know. Uh, but I really wanted to do something which is referent to paint, referencing painting, but it's made mm -hmm. out of paper. Interesting. Um so that that triangle of of more intense red is that a totally different sheet of paper then what what is going on there when you you know adhere them with like you know the jade with a you know really good adhesive um it did it, it turns transparent but i have to say i did cheat a little bit there i thought i saw it happen <laughs> and i just okay and i just did a little touch Okay. But it, it does happen on its own when it does that overlap, which is really important because it gives it space. Mm -hmm. it, it stops yeah. it from being a you know, completely flat enterprise and, and it, suddenly you have space. And that, that intrigued me when that happened and I couldn't resist noodling around with it. I, I can't blame you for that. Um, <laughs> it's like, it's like kind of this like stunning explosion of, of a painting slash non-painting. Um, Every time I, I was going back to your work, I kept going back to this one because I was I was just like so attracted to it um, and just kept thinking about it. You had mentioned something about text. And so I think it's important that we talk about text a little bit in your work. Um, Anya, if you wanna go to 33, that's a good example um, of one where we can see text very, very easily. Oh, yeah. um, and we have others in the slideshow, but here's, here's one that we can look at um, pretty quickly. Um, so we can see here um, this work on the wall, um, which reads video. And then is that a, what a single channel video or what's, what's going on with the TV there? It's live. Oh, it's live. Okay, yeah. so is it, is it then is it taping something across the, what's going on? It's, um, uh, it's the, the, this is, I don't know if you can tell from the, from the image, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it, it, it's painted, they're both painted. I mean, the ground is painted and the uh, thing on top of it is painted, mm -hmm. uh, but it's sewn, it's a flap basically. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's stitched on the top with my little hands. And, um, and then the word video is sort of, 
in that font deliberately done that way. And then related to that, I, I'm, I've said this enough that I'm, I'm very interested in painting as an old media and, and other media like new media, which is no longer new, but it's just media now. So this was done whenever this was 2006. I don't know, I don't remember. Um, but I had, I, I, I had came across an amazing painting of Miro's, it's in the Met, and uh, 1924, and he did four of them, and it was a kind of a surrealist uh, wager about making paintings with language, and, and the piece is called Photo, and it's, and it's uh, the, the script on the bottom, it says Photo, and that, I, that's I really riffed off of uh, Miro's hand there, mm -hmm. uh, and so, and I used that word Photo in, in, in another painting. Yeah, we, oh, you got it. Yeah. Fabulous. <laughs> you know the painting. Excellent. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. And the, the painting fascinates me because it really, it, it exists in this kind of world, which uh, it's like the nether world or something, uh, in that that, the, that font of photo uh, is, is something that is, is very late 19th, early 20th century. So he's, and it's all done by hand. So he's, he's referring to photo, it's kind of synesthetic effect. You, you feel photo and it, you're not seeing photo. So you're reading it photo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and at the same time, he says, this is, this is the color of my dreams. And it's this kind of splotch of, of, of blue paint. Um, and it, it, the painting had a, a huge startling effect on me in the way, and I had been using uh, words or like language for a while and I thought this is really great so I used that photo and then in the video piece I thought okay what else is I thought we've moved on from photo where are we now and mm -hmm. so then the video piece followed that and if we, can we go back to that or is it adjacent yeah thank you and I just happened to um, have a piece of canvas in my studio uh, which was at, at, at the time that was the size of the largest plasma screen tv and so I attached that and then um, uh, my guy across the hall from me, his studio, I just told him this recently, Sean Mullen, he was throwing out a TV. It was in the hallway, it was in garbage. And I thought, oh my God, this is great. And, uh, and all the, his old taping from the antenna and everything is on there. It really wasn't, you could just tune it in analog, but you didn't see anything. And I, and I snatched it and I wrote film backwards on it. And so this became film video as part of the piece. And so it's it's now uh, digital. So that little thing sticking up, um, that little little pedestal sticking up, uh, is a is a um, it's a digital uh, antenna. So it picks up all the current channels and yeah. I love it. Um, so is the what what do we consider this then? Is this is this painting? Is your video a video? Is it collage? It's one piece. Okay. Is it collage? You know, I, I I think I use the word assemblage. It's yes, like, yes. That's about as far as I can go. I'm interested. I'm interested in collage in so far as my my view of it is that it's it it emerged in a sense that at at a, at a time as a as a form. I mean, it's been going on for a long time. Whether it's the old, the old kind of like uh, femage, which was an article uh, or it was. Uh, something about heresies kind of identified, heresies, old, the old feminist magazine, uh, identified as kind of a, a particular kind of collage as femage, because women have been doing this for a long time. Mm -hmm. And now it's called scrapbooking or something. But uh, to my point um, is that it always represented for art a rupture, a rupture from the absolute plane. If you go back to you know analytic cubism, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a rupture. It, it's something has is, is, been, changed it's been ruptured and so i think that I, I have the spirit of that rupture in my work uh that that is the it's painting plus material it's painting or it's material plus painting mm -hmm. so it and that that sense of collage or rupture because it can be any material uh mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be a strictly speaking with collage another flat material so this is in a sense another kind of uh rupture but i, I just want to talk about things and so whatever is handy, you know, to let me do that, hopefully it, it can work. So, and, and, I, and, and then to also use painting in a way that engages with this other, other past, uh, you know, it, it, it links it to another past in the present. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, it's interesting that you talk about this, uh, the, the idea of assemblage, the idea of rupture. 
when we're looking at something that also includes text. Um, yeah. Because of course, that is uh, one of the reasons why the Cubists are so interested in using text, right? It's, it's that letter forms are abstractions in and of themselves, but also that they kind of break that fourth wall of painting um, and, and do something else, right? Um, text exists on a different register from representational painting. Um, and so I was, I was curious about that. Um, in our, your interview with Fong, um, our, our fearless leader, um, he asks you about text and you say that that's interesting because you don't think they're texts. Um, and so I, I think that I want to ask you about this. If, if they're not texts, are they, are they just letters? Are, are they the rupture? Um, I think they're, they may be uh, the rupture because we're, I'm not forming a sentence. I'm not saying mm -hmm. this is not video. So, <laughs> um, so, but that's just why I don't think of them as, as text. It's sort of, uh, a way of, and you have to ask, what is video? That's not video, what is it? <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, I don't use grammar. Uh, and so I, and my work is not text-based, based exactly. Um, uh, there may be a proposition as in who cares, uh, which again calls on somebody who's observing the work. What does that mean? You know, I, and it's familiar. I mean, video, film are familiar words. And I mean, in a way that, you know, abstraction is, is quite estranged from normal routines, from daily routine. Mm -hmm. And I think words are, they, they are, they do. I mean, of course, uh, fonts and, and, and typography are, are abstractions in a sense, but they're readable. Uh, mm -hmm. they, and they, they, they function within a meaning of a larger string. So they used for different purposes. And so I think that I'm using these words or these phrases. I mean, I don't have them up on the wall, whatever. They're, I have them all over the place, but they're not on the wall right now. Um, they, they are a way of engaging with like, you know, boots on the ground. You know, like here we are, painting is not necessarily something which, you know, you, I want to engage. I want to like say, okay, here I am. And what do you make of this? Uh, and it is a painting, um, so, and it's stitched and you can pick this flap up and, and it, somebody say it's funny and it, it actually is meant to be because it just, it evaporates. You can lift that thing up and there's nothing there. So you, you know, it's a complicated question you're asking and it's a very complicated answer, yes. <laughs> but they're not text. <laughs> I, I, think I, I think I agree with you, um, oh. but I think also just that, um, Perhaps they're texts to people who um, don't read Western letter forms automatically. Oh. Um, because I'm thinking um, about the idea, um, for example, Bruce Nauman's Please Pay Attention, Please, right? Yep. Um, if we are native English speakers slash readers, we read that and immediately we pay attention, right? And then we're the victim of the joke. Um, you know, we can't help but but read this thing because we can't help but read it, right? That's that's what we do as people who can read. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps a person who may not be able to read this then could fully see this as text as opposed to just kind of sliding into it as something that is just an image or an abstraction. Yeah. Well, if, if I had the intention of doing that, that could be quite interesting. I mean, to do something that would resemble something that for, uh, for my view as a reader and speaker of English, do something that look <laughs> like it should be readable in English, but it's not. I mean, I would go in the opposite direction. Uh, but I, you know, I, I haven't thought about it that way, just to mm -hmm. tell you the truth. I, I really haven't. I was wondering about it because um, the, the film is painted backwards. Yeah. And so, of course, then this this makes us do that work, right? Um, I guess you know, like thinking about like Leonardo's sketchbooks being written backwards and stuff like that. You know, like it, it actually makes us um, other ourselves in a way that reading in our own language can't can't let us do. Well, you know, it, it, that's yeah. I 
it's something I need to roll around for a while, but I'm, I'm pretty flat footed uh, because I, you know, I see film as something that's really in the past. Mm. Uh, you know, film as a medium mm -hmm. or as a material, like, mm -hmm. and Tassana Dean has written, you know, in, in terrific stuff about this and other people have too. But to, to put that word backwards, to looking at a moving image that, it, that existed in film, is this tuned in, by the way, to like 1960s sitcoms in black and white. So, and, and <laughs> so um, I'm in flat-footed in the way that um, I'm, I'm asking, I guess, somebody to look about and consider that in a sense, the, uh, the development or the dilution of, of, of a medium. Um, so that's, that's sort of where I'm thinking very much about that, mm -hmm. uh, li literally, I mean, I'm a literalist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think we have to, be, right in in this particular piece um yeah. what else can we do yeah yeah um rochelle it is 201 and i am oh, no. of your time can you believe it i know should we keep going or do you want to stop no if people if people have things they want to address what do you feel it's okay we do that now amanda yeah i think that that would be great i'm hey. i'm going to i'm going to stop talking and i'm going to turn it over to anya so that she can turn it over to to your your adoring fans <laughs> Maybe not so much anymore. <laughs> Even Thank more you. so after this. This is so wonderful. Thank you so much for this conversation. Um, our first question will be coming from Ksenia M. Sobolova, excuse me, and you can turn on your microphone now. Hi. Hi, Rochelle. Hey, or hi. Hi, Ksenia. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, Rochelle, I'm very curious about the title and who the you is and whether this you is singular or plural. Ah. Um, it's, it's plural. And again, I'm flat-footed. Um, I'm really talking about my work. <laughs> so <laughs> you again, I mean, I get to deal with it. <laughs> uh, so, um, but it, it, you know, it's a, it's a way of, of me kind of trying, trying to have to deal with something that I, you know, it's like, oh God, you know, why do I have to deal with you now? You again, it's also like seeing an old friend, you know, you again, or maybe somebody you don't want to see. Um, it, it has, I think multiple means. What does it mean to you? What's your take on it, Xenia? Oh yes, am I, I'm, I accidentally muted myself again. Okay, well, I, I thought it was your work and I thought it was plural indeed uh, because of course I've met you and I have a little bit of a sense yeah. uh, but then I just found myself thinking oh wouldn't it would be interesting if it was singular because it added a certain romanticism to it and yeah. I just kept being who's Rochelle's you <laughs> <laughs> well, and the flower paintings are quite romantic well you can have many romantic views <laughs> so. that is very true that is very true. I take back the comment. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> That's a great question and comment. <laughs> Thank you, Ksenia. Um, our next question will be coming from uh, Marie Birkdahl. Hi. Um, Hi. I would like to ask you if you think there is um, a connection between materiality and ethics. What I mean is, for instance, I live in Germany and a lot of the things that happened here happened because you dehumanize people by turning them into numbers and turning people into numbers, you remove their materiality. And I think your works is all about materiality. Do you see materiality as something political? Yeah. Sorry, Emery, keep going. No, uh, that was my question. It, uh, well, it's an interesting context that you present uh, as a, a kind of a, an ethical parallel. Um, and so I would say, yes, <laughs> I think the materiality is very specific. And it's, it's, I say in, in terms of, it's, it's not so much for me ethical, but you know, to kind of painting is such a, uh, a problematic abstraction. And I, so I think that that materiality that I'm speaking of um, is to kind of uh, 
resuscitate or to, to bring back to life or something, not that I have the power to do that at all, but to like really be present, to, to make it work, be present with something that's like, if I put a water bottle, you know, in the painting, I, mean, I wouldn't do that, but it, 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 it says something about the moment it's being made. And that's the idea, because I, I haven't mentioned this at all in the talk with Amanda, but on other occasions, this, this notion of what I wanted my work to be for a very long time, it was very deliberate, uh, was for it to be um, a, a chronicle or a, a, a record in a sense of, of the condition of life. And so in that sense, it, I, that's how I'm understanding or I'm able to kind of respond to your, your question uh, and that these, this no, notion of social conditions, uh, whether it's you know, something personal to me or something much larger, which is an ethical uh, condition. Uh, yes, so I'd say um, I'm very interested in, in, in having the work be alive with those conditions, like who cares? You know, that's a condition. And uh, it's not a number. Great, thank you for that wonderful question and, and that very thoughtful answer, Rochelle. Um, we'll now turn to our friend G.E. Schwartz. Thank you so much, Anya and uh, Amanda and, and Rochelle. And I just want to say, first off, I don't love your work, but boy, am I activated by it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you. <laughs> oh, no, thank you for the years of enjoyment of it. <laughs> you enjoy it. <laughs> do, you, do you believe order can emerge as redeemable in, in the work uh, of the social and the psychic uh, through um, uh, the redeemable and, and through that, that kind of thing? Oof. I can't think of an example of what, how redeemable would, you know, it's not my vocabulary. Um, it, it's hard for me to kind of enter into that notion of, of kind of redeeming or offering a way, an, an option, uh, maybe, uh, uh, from something uh, to something. I mean, I, I think that I'm, I'm, no, probably, I mean, I, it's an interesting question. I use the word interesting a lot because these are things I haven't thought about before. Uh, so it, I don't use it glibly. I'm being completely serious. Uh, Redeemable, um, I think more like, um, I just think I, I, I want it just to be present. I mean, I'm, I'm so intrigued from very early, you know, on and like deciding, oh, I could maybe be an artist, really intrigued uh, by how painting is, has represented culture, a culture, not all culture, but, and so I think that I wanted to enter into that field, not to redeem it, but to be present. So I think to be present is really important to me and it should be important to everybody in whatever they do. So uh, I just happen to be a painter. And so I want, I want that to be present because I, I think that my experience is not so different from others. And sometimes I can, you know, like deal with that and others not, but redeemable. I think to be, to be present at all now, it's such a difficult, Life has been really difficult so for quite a while. And so maybe the idea of being present and just recording that in itself is, is establishes something, if not redeemable, but a record. Um, so I, yeah, I think I, I wanna make a record. That's it. Well, thank you. It sure is transforming. That's well, thank sure. you. Are you so, George or GE? What do we call you? Uh, sure. GE. I'm GE. Okay, GE. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. I I I, I appreciate you. your stuff on Instagram too. Thank you. Oh, oh thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, GE, um, for your question. Um, we're now going to turn to uh, Carrie Amirata. You can turn on your microphone and video if you'd like. I wasn't prepared to be on video. <laughs> um, it was so wonderful to see both the shows in New York City. They were amazing in person. But my question was about having a steady teaching job and if it allowed you to feel more free to be able to create what you wanted to create in your studio since you didn't have the pressure of please make five more of these specific works. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's a big, big, big yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, so do you teach? No, I don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I, I, how the, the, I guess potentially like how does the, working with a gallery and 
making the work in the studio, it, it seeps in sometimes. So it's just, I'm just curious about that relationship. Yeah, I, it, I think that I was very fortunate and I've had basically had two full-time teaching jobs and they each were rewarding in the sense that, of course, there were certainly a lot of you know, bad spots along the way uh, that took a lot of energy and attention uh, and care. Uh, but I was able to detach. I learned pretty early on that I, I could detach and then I could do my work and I did not have to, I did what I wanted to do and it funded that. And of course it was a different time economically when I was younger and, and you could afford a studio and you could afford to live and you know even go out. <laughs> so that was cheap. <laughs> so, um, and so uh, this is, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I found that the teaching was um, early on, it really, I, I felt I had a great responsibility uh, to to understand what I was saying to people. And so, yeah, so it helped me figure out my work somewhat, um, you know, not in terms of ideas, but in terms of like what I thought, what I thought and, and not a stale set of ideas, I think. Um, so, and I, you know, I also, well, yeah, it was, it was, yes, it's a big yes. I go back to the big yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Um, our final question will be coming from our publisher and artistic director, Fong Bui. Okay. Cool. Where Thank are you? you? I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Amanda. Um, boy, you guys talk like old friends. I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I've been following your work, of course, long, long time. We know each other a long time. Yes. Uh, and listening to you talking just now and knowing your also history yourself, you know, but be reminded just now it's a pleasure because I can't help but to think of uh, what Potom, you know, Propokan once say, variety is life, uniformity is death. And, and he had a huge influence on one of our great heroine, of course, uh, uh, Elmer Golden. Mm -hmm. He was, in fact, a huge important figure to Bonnet Newman, too, because Bonnet Newman was dedicated to his own belief in anarchist activities. And I know that he ran um, in 33 uh, on, on the platform of free education, outdoor cafe, as a way to amplify sociability. Mm -hmm. as a way to bring people together, like the way people would do in France, and Parisian scene and where's else. And it's, it's as tools to rail against the challenge, sovereignistic and, you know, xenophobic politic at the time, because it was quite contrary to isol, you know, isolationist sentiment of US, not want to get involved in the war. And that was a pretext of Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. um, to also argue for the same case, you know, take care of our own domestic national pride and whatnot. Why am I bringing all that up? Because uh, you say it yourself, flat-footed, um, in a way that generate this dissonant. I think of your, your, your work as dissonant music in a way, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, it just remind me of that sense of incongruousness, you know? So question finally is <laughs> um, political, your po political life. I mean, I, I know you've been making painting and for the longest time in teaching seem to be very harmonious, even though you know how to let go when you leave the, glass, the classroom and enter the studio. So it's a trick. It's a very huge discipline thing that some artists among our friends we know won't be able to resolve, you know? Some have been. So mm -hmm. the question is, what is your politics <laughs> have it <laughs> over the years? Because <laughs> in a way, there's a huge sense of, of anarchistic energy in the work, yeah. very consistently throughout. It's never been, you know, easily submit to one way or the other yeah. uh, tendency, pictorially speaking. Yeah, no, it, 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 it I think it, it, it is a, 
it is a form of, of anarchism in, in a sense, but but you you know I I'm not throwing the system away. I'm not you know saying it, it's a shitty system. I'm saying it's it's a system that that can be taken over. <laughs> so <laughs> and I can't do it myself. Uh, it's not it's not me. Uh, but I, I, I you know it, it, it's like if, if painting if painting let's presume that abstraction at times has been viewed as a very kind of a packaged, you know, deal. Uh, and, and it's like, oh, so yeah. And, and right now, I mean, there's, um, a, you know, a huge uh, number of, of artists uh, are working who find it very important uh, and, and to, to use narrative uh, to, uh, to stake a position uh, politically. And I, I think for me, um, and I think that's that's very important. It's something that it, it's too human for me to do because that brings so much uh, empathy, you know. Uh, it, it, and I, I think I like to start from this cold place, that, and then and then bring the empathy to it, uh, and and so to kind of change it that way. So maybe that's not quite an anarchist. What would that be called? Um, I don't know. You might you might have it. What would you say? <laughs> Well, it's what our friend um, Peter Limbo Wilson will call it temporary autonomous zone. <laughs> <laughs> A way to activate the space. In the <laughs> A temporary autonomous zone. Exactly. Well, it's a similar idea. Of, of but I don't think it's temporary. I don't think it's temporary. <laughs> I mean, I am. I'm not going to be here forever, but, <laughs> uh, you know, this, it's the, I like that, uh, this autonomous zone. But one has to read it. I mean, I think for, for me, painting, if it's a political position, we know what we've looked at as what painting is, whether it's abstract or representational, although those are not my necessary categories because there's a lot of stuff that exists outside of painting. So I, I'm just, I'm only addressing painting at the moment. Uh, but one has to know something of, of, a, of a, an abstraction in order to kind of understand why it might be uh, uh, or, uh, kind of occupying an autonomous zone. Uh, within, so absolutely, yeah. I just thinking of that because you know his his famous book Mutual Aid, which was the same, uh, it it re resonate the same um, uh, aspiration. I mean, in other words, despite of the Darwinian concept of the survival of the fittest, he proposed cooperation rather than conflict is the most important factor. You know to do the work that we do, you know? Mm. I find that maybe that's the case where your dedication to teaching is such an amazing um, commitment that allow you the freedom that you can be so um, immersive in different way of thinking about painting. Thank you. Well, yeah, I think the other part of this teaching is that what isn't talked about really a whole lot are the students. Yeah. And, uh, and I think this is a, it, it's really kind of critical uh, uh, because I mean I'm not of that generation or I maybe was when I started teaching I was you know much younger uh, but I mean I I feel like I, I I have some insight I don't do a lot of teaching I'm doing some uh, you know minimal but a lot of talks and whatever online or visiting artist things and then I really you know what what people what young younger artists are thinking about now are not what artists are thinking about 30. 25, 20 years ago. And so I think that's part of a mute, the mutual aid part of the teaching that you can be. It's not like you're, you're getting your influences from your students, but you're understanding what a part of the world thinks about, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a very, um, it, it, it's a vital part of that mutual aid. I'm just stealing that title uh, of what teaching is. And, yeah. you know, so I learn what they think and they learn what I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's mutual. It's super mutual. Yeah. Yeah. And congratulations on on the the show. It's thank you. Thank you very much. The two the New York shows close on Saturday. I'm going tomorrow. Okay. Well, I won't see you there, but I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. I will let you know. I'll text you. Uh, Good chat. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Back to you, Anya. Thank you so much, Fong, for that quick, great question to close us out. Um, I'm posting in the chat once more a link to all the different exhibitions for you again, um, which I encourage everyone to check out. Um, and now we'll turn uh, to our, our tradition. Where's, where's Amanda? Where's Amanda? Oh, Amanda's, yeah. I wanted to say before. I'm here. 
I wanted to thank Amanda before I <laughs> before I lost her entirely. And oh, well, I'm, I'm sticking around. Don't worry. Okay, great. Okay, you can't get rid of me <laughs> that easily. All right. okay. <laughs> Sorry, Anya. Oh yeah, no worries. Yeah, I hope I hope you all um, stay for our our poetry reading. Um, we have a tradition of ending um, each event with a poetry reading, and I'm thrilled to welcome um, our poet laureate of the day, Bunny Wood, to the stage. Interdisciplinary writer Bunny Wood currently resides in Atlanta, Georgia. They just graduated from Pratt Institute and they are working on their first novel. So Bunny, please close us out. Hi everyone. Um, I'm just gonna read one poem. It's called Harmony Is This Love. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Lush waves and water cupping in my ears. Shrieking seagulls flapping above and away. The beach eases me into itself, peaceful purpose. I've never been so present in a daydream. I acclimate to this space and for a while, it's not even my body that naps, it's the air. Breath by the water, taking a break from the quickness of other times. Cherish is a special word. I've been heavily pondering the concept of intention to know the meaning in my words before I speak, but the language, gut, chest, neck, they speak before I do. How to properly translate the body, how to believe in the translation of inaudible language and its purpose once there. In the open, I confess myself, but when did intention become important? How quickly it became a pillar, makeshift value I was creating to urge me toward the depth in me, transformed into a body of its own. I created a version of myself I could possibly believe in. Last spring challenged all that had shaped me into me, the person I had been, broken open, the illusions I allowed replaced with fresh clarity. It required unraveling and I've lost a lot along the way. Even then I'm feeling the meaning in my memories that I never saw before. While the unveiling takes place, the coming together rises like water flows with such harmony. I don't want to tame these high little giggles shaking out of me. I'm smiling extraordinarily natural. That's made it real easy to feel gratitude. I sit down to write. Therein now lies that sandy beach, cold beneath a slow gulping tide falling back into the waves, my sentience. Renewed knowing of the seconds between a thought and an impulse gives way to pause not only for contemplation, but for the truth to sink in, it aims to nourish, not drown me. For the first time, I'm able to understand the patterns revealed, no longer subtle, and without fail, I'm presented with more, my convictions. I'm learning to make space for the extremity of my emotions. Time is languid as it gazes upon the world and thoughts resting in the corners of my eyes, roundness of my breath between waking and sinking. When an impulse arises, I feel it boil within me taunt me, threaten to explode. My lips shake, my eyes stop, the waves settle, begin crawling back. I'm learning to control myself. I'm learning to let it all go. The days hold hands as they pass, merging with one another, vanishing into a wide sea of feeling, how to not forget, so later I can remember. Intention is still everything. It's strength within how deep I trust who I am with myself and witness. I will contradict myself because nothing about me is static. That is a knowing, that is a writer, that is a poet, that is me, a silky statue being imagined and chiseled, a memory, smiles, seconds, and numbers, a feeling, the language of time. And that's it. Thank you so much, Bunny. That was such a, a beautiful poem, beautiful way to close out today. I'm really appreciative. Um, and thank you to Rochelle and to Amanda um, for your wonderful conversation. Um, we'd also like to thank Bella from Candace Mady and Sabrina from Bridget Donahue and everyone over at the galleries for helping to make today's event possible. Um, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel where we'll upload today's conversation shortly. And you can join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation um, between Carlos Basualdo Joan Simon, Robert Storr, and Constance Llewellyn on the event of Bruce Naum and His Mark on view at Sparon Westwater. Um, we will conclude with a poetry reading by Bianca Stone. And now you should all be able to turn on your microphones to say thank you and goodbye. Thank you all.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Thank Amanda. you, Thank you, Amanda. Uh, Thank, you Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Rochelle. Wonderful. This was really great. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you, Amanda. Thank you Rochelle. Thank you. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Congratulations on the reading also. Thank you. Go see the show, you guys. Thank you, Bunny. Thank you. Thank you, Bunny. What, what can I say? Can I go? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, stay. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks so Bye, much. Bye, Rochelle. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Have, Have a great Bye. afternoon. Bye.